All right, uh, we start a little bit late, so we're going to get right uh, into this. But I do want to say, um, just just want to encourage you, as you probably have been doing, um, to pray for your brethren. Um, pray for the congregation here. Uh, I know that as this goes on, uh, many have had their, their job affected, uh, have had their hours cut. Um, I can see that uh, the contribution has um, uh, been affected by that, and we expected that, and we understand that. Uh, God expects you to give based on what you have, not what you don't have. But um, one of those things, maybe, maybe take a directory out and, and just go and, and, and pray for each member. Uh, it kind of helps to jog the memory and, and, and you kind of be reminded what's going on. Take a bulletin, keep, keep uh, those in your prayers as well. So this morning I want to talk to you and uh, I've got my watch on here. I talk about spirituality and how to measure it. And I thought this would be a good lesson with this pandemic because, um, let's face it, when you, three times a week, you get up, you get ready, you go to church, you're with physically your other brethren, you're, you're together studying God's word, um, it, it does help you to kind of put that measurement of spirituality in your mind. And, and now that a lot of times we're isolated, we're not going to, to meet with our brethren, at least not as much as we used to, uh, some uh, hunker down at home, it, it, it's easy to kind of lose sight of that daily measurement of spirituality. You might remember James, a, a book we're going to start studying tonight in our, our Zoom Bible class, talked about this very thing, and he used the analogy of a mirror. And he says, when a man looks into the mirror, now he was talking about in the analogy of, or, or the lesson of being a doer, not just a hearer. And the hearer is one who looks in the mirror and he sees things out of place, but he doesn't do anything about it. He doesn't have any evaluation, he doesn't have any action on that measurement. But the doer... Not only hears, but he looks, he evaluates, he asks, how am I doing? What do I need to work on? And then does it. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how do you measure spirituality. Do you every day kind of have that evaluation in your life? How am I doing in Jesus Christ, in my walk with Christ? And I would imagine the answer to that is yes, you do. But what is it that you use to measure your spirituality? Um, well, people could say, well, the New Testament, yeah, but what specifically in the New Testament? Well, maybe some would say something like this, the better I know Christ, and I, I try to know Christ better, the better then I can evaluate how I'm doing, and, and that makes a lot of sense. But what I want to do is I want to um, <clears throat> introduce to you something we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. Uh, a parameter of spirituality that Paul used with the Thessalonians. And hopefully you, you see something you've never seen before, at least a connection you've never seen before in this regard. As you know, Paul was very concerned with the Thessalonians. And so he sent Timothy back to find out about them, to find out how they were doing. How they were doing, not just physically, but more importantly, spiritually. So what was it that he was looking for that would give him that answer? How did he measure that? And so that's what we're going to kind of talk about um, this morning. But before we get into that, I, I want to start off with this point. Becoming a spiritual being is not easy. We have that dual nature of flesh and spirit. And we know that we're supposed to let the spirit win out. But it is not easy to become a spiritual person when you live in a fleshly world. And Jesus found that out as he came to earth and he talked to various people, even the Jews who you would think would be spiritual people, even the Jewish leaders, he didn't, he didn't find that. There was a disconnect. For example, the Gospel of John brings this out better than probably anybody uh, in the New Testament. Uh, here in John chapter 3, we know we have the story of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a Jew, he is a Pharisee, he is a ruler 
of the Jews. If anyone is in tune with spirituality and, and a spiritual concept of, of, of lessons, you would think it would be Nicodemus. But we know Jesus speaks to him spiritually, but there's a disconnect. Nicodemus can only understand the flesh. And so in this conversation, Jesus says to Nicodemus, one must be born again. And how does Nicodemus take it? Well, he says, well, how can a man go back to his mother's womb? He doesn't understand what Jesus is saying. So Jesus tries to point out that which is born of flesh is flesh. But I'm not talking about that. You've already experienced that birth. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. I'm talking to you about spiritual birth. And, and Nicodemus just had a difficult time relating to what Jesus was saying. You go to the very next chapter, John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. And we might say, well, that makes a little more sense. But the Samaritans were believers in God, and they believed they were worshiping God, and that was their desire. But they even had a trouble understanding spirituality. And so Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman and he's trying to speak spiritually about living water. And she can only understand physical water. She, she can't understand anything beyond that. And so Jesus says, if you knew who you were speaking to, he would have given you living water. And so she says, well, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. How are you going to get this water? And of course, he's not talking about physical water. You go to John chapter 6, and you have John performing this extraordinary miracle where over 5,000 people are um, fed with leftovers. And so the people are so impressed by Jesus with all that he's able to do with this last miracle. And so they say, truly, this is the prophet who's come to the world, and they, take him, they, they want to take him by force and make him king. And sometimes we look at that and we say, well, that, that's good. That's exactly what Jesus came to do. He came to be the king of kings. In fact, that, that kind of that statement of him being a king was above the cross as he was crucified. So this should be something Jesus accepts, but what? Jesus withdraws. Why? Because they want to make him a physical king. Going back to the Old Testament, they want to make him a king like the nations all around them. Well, that's not the type of king Jesus is. His kingdom is not of this earth. It is a spiritual kingdom, as he said to Pilate. And so the next day they find Jesus, and Jesus, one of the first words is he says, Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. Verse 27. And so their answer to that is, well, what then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? Verse 30. And we shake our heads and go, well, let's go right back up here. Where were you yesterday and what did you see Jesus do? And they just don't get it. And we can be hard on them and we can say they just don't understand. But if we lived in that day and that time and we were in that culture and that time, uh, atmosphere, I, I'm not sure if I'd get it either. Um, it's hard to be spiritual, and, and it's hard to think on that level. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, Paul says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually praised. Um, I still struggle with thinking as a spiritual man. You might remember Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, I wanted to talk to you as, as spiritual men, but I couldn't do it because you're carnal. Um, sometimes we get upset um, when we're talking to people about Jesus and about the church, and they look at us as kind of crazy lunatics. Sometimes the way we talk, the people are just like, what are, you, what are you talking about? And we don't like that. Well, what's going on? Well, they don't understand what we're saying because they're natural, they're fleshly. They haven't tried to become that spiritual person. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. 
For those who are according to the flesh, that their minds on the, the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And so, one thing I, I want to tell us is that if we want to become better in our spirituality, where do we got to set our mind? We got to set our mind on the Spirit. Spiritual things, like we're doing this morning. But a lot of times the temptation for us as Christians is to try to, to reach spirituality by as minimum activity in the spirit as we can. And what we need to understand is that we cannot uh, improve our spirituality by spending a bunch of times with fleshly things over and over, spending more time in the flesh over and over, and spending very little time in the spirit. That's going to be counterproductive. And so, as we know... There are fleshly activities. There's no problem with that, that we live in a fleshly world. We're fleshly creatures. But we need to do what? We need to have that balance. And if we're spending all of our time involved in fleshly things, that limits our time in spiritual things, we're, we're going to be affected in our spirituality. And so I hope as a goal, we always have daily to evaluate our spirituality and as Paul said to the Thessalonians, I, I see your love for the brethren, but excel still more to continue to work on those things. And so let's talk a little bit about Paul at Thessalonica. Um, for sake of time, we're not going to read uh, Acts 17 in these passages, but very quickly, you know that Paul went into Thessalonica, preached the gospel, started the church had many converts there, and then had to leave long before he wanted to. And the Jews there at Thessalonica, they were very good at being Jews. They did not like the gospel of Christ. And so they, they, they had a death plot on Paul. He had to leave. And not only that, after that he goes down to Berea, and the Jews of Thessalonica don't like the Jews of Berea because they're, they're just kind of... You know, they're kind of wimpy when it comes to the old law. They actually are listening to Paul, and the Bible describes them as noble-minded. But what do the Jews of Thessalonica do? They come all the way down to Berea, and they force Paul out of Berea. And so Paul had to leave the Thessalonians, number one, before he wanted to, and under uh, such conditions of hostility and persecution, he was worried about them. And so... Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And this is where we learn of Paul telling them in this first letter he writes to them his concern for them. And so beginning in verse 1 it says, Therefore when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And look at this. We sent Timothy our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith so that no one would be a dis that uh, excuse me so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this for indeed when we were with you we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction and so it came to pass as you know for this reason, look at this, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us, just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all of our distress and afflictions, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. And so what you have here is you have this situation I sent Timothy to go find out how you were doing in the faith. How you were doing spiritually. And he came back and he told me how you were doing spiritually. And so, here's the question. What, what measurement did Timothy use to gear their spirituality? 
What was it that he told Paul that led Paul to say, I am so comforted, I am so thankful that you're doing good spiritually? Well, the answer is right there in the text we read. Did you, did you see it? What did, or how did Paul measure their spirituality? Well, verse 5, Timothy sent to find out about their faith. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to take a lesson to talk about how can we gear and, and measure our faith in regard to spirituality. What, what is it we need to develop in our faith? But that makes sense, right? To see if someone has faith, to see if they're faithful. But then in verse 6, Timothy came and reported not only about their faith, but about their love. And so we're going to talk a little bit about love. What does our love need to look like? And I think we, we've seen with this pandemic, with our you know, fellow citizens, and maybe even our own brethren, that we've been challenged about what does that love mean? Does it mean we always have to agree with one another to love them? And the answer is no. I think we've seen love as a form of, of respect and understanding more clearly than we've ever seen it. There's a third thing that he mentions in chapter 1. Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Because he got such a good report of their spirituality, Paul, as he often does in these letters, he says, We give thanks to God always for you, Always for all of you, making mention of your of you in our prayers, costly bearing in mind your notice this work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. So, how did Paul measure spirituality? Well, he gave thanks because of their spirituality as he geared it by their work of faith, by their labor of love by their steadfastness of hope. And so, I'm not saying that this is the only way we can measure it, but this was a common way in the New Testament that, that spirituality was measured. Faith, love, and hope. And, and in the coming lesson, we're going to take a look at each one of these to help us measure our spirituality. How often do these come together? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Notice these three again mentioned later on, where Paul says, this is what those of the flesh are doing, but we're not of the flesh. And so you got this, this little armor of God illustration again, where faith and love are the helmet and hope, is the helmet, the hope of salvation. And so you have passages like 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, where Paul says, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And what's Paul dealing with? Paul's dealing with these Corinthians having these problems, and the problems are because what? They're fleshly. And so what is he, what's he teaching the Corinthians to solve that? Well, one of the underlying things is faith, hope, and love. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, again, not having enough time to go through that and read it, but you're going to find all three of these in that passage that talks about that God uh, loved us and Christ died for us when we were enemies and godless and all that. Why? Because of faith, hope, and love. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. We see the exact same thing. Let's go over there and, and read that passage very quickly. 1 Thessalonians 1. Verse 15 and 16. A lot of these you're going to see in the opening of Paul's prayer. Okay? For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. And so there you have two of the three mentioned. And then Colossians chapter 1 verse 3 we're again in the opening prayer that Paul discusses. We give thanks to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, 
since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. So you see these three coming up quite a bit uh, in the New Testament, and there's a reason for that. And what I was hoping that you see in this is that we all know about faith, and we all know about hope, and we all know about love, but have we seen them in this kind of context? There's a reason these three are mentioned so often. Uh, again, you're going to see them in Philemon chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 as well. And so there are times where all three of them are mentioned. There are times where it's just faith and love. And here's the passages, 1 Corinthians 13, Galatians 5, Ephesians 3, Ephesians 6, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, and so forth, 1 Timothy, all those passages. Sometimes it is faith and hope, Galatians 5, Colossians 1, 1 Peter 1. And so these, these, th there's a connection with these. Not only an important part of a Christian life, but they're often used by Paul to determine one's spirituality. And so when we talk about how are we doing spiritually, when we talk about that we are studying God's word, whether we're together as a group or as an individual, we're not just reading God's word for the sake of reading God's word. We're doing these spiritual activities, what? To help us to understand how we're doing spiritually. We're doing it because when you open up God's word, you're opening up that mirror. And there's an evaluation in that. And there needs to be some honest truthfulness to that. So that, what? As we go out the door and we go out to this fleshly world, we're prepared to live spiritually, to be that light and to be that salt to the world. And so we're going to start talking about these three elements. What are we to look for? How can we judge faith and hope and love in regards to spirituality? What does that look like? What can be some of my goals? So important this is, especially in this day and time. As the world, more than ever, needs to see what it means to be a Christian. People living godly lives, joyfully, positively, in the midst of these people that are complaining about this, and down about this, and we don't like this, and I've had it with this. We have this great opportunity, as we talked last Sunday, to show spirituality by what? Faith, hope, and love. We'll turn it over to Andrew as we begin our singing portion. <laughs>